Hi folks, Dave here. Ordinarily, I don't take a look at scientific papers on this channel because they are very difficult to read and I don't really need to appeal to the establishment to support my work. That having been said, the topic of, well, hooking a few diodes up to a solar panel, diode chains or diode strings, has attracted a ton of trolls and a ton of idiots for some reason. And not that my other work doesn't also attract idiots, but it seems like the diodes really have a special capability to do that. Anyway, this paper is one of my all-time favorite papers. It was written on the subject of using solar power diodes to cook with. And of course, the focus is on the poor people in the world who don't have a lot of resources. They don't have large solar panel rays. Basically, they have it tough. And as you can see, this research was conducted by this list of good people here. And I don't know a lot about them, but I'm sure they're very smart. And they work at these various universities here. Anyway, I wanted to highlight their work because I think they did a fantastic job presenting the concept of solar power diode chains versus direct connected resistive heaters. They did a really good job. And it's not really that hard of a paper to read. It's actually very straightforward. I like the way it's laid out. And, of course, they're going to go through a lot of details to set up the experiments they did, how they calibrate the solar panels, the theoretical power output, things like that. And they did a good job, though. Anyway, here's their setup. And you can see right away that they're showing it as a power supply for charging a cell phone or running lighting. And they're comparing it on the left with a traditional so-called off-electro-grid system that has a battery, charge controller, and all that good stuff. And an induction cooker in this case. A diode chain costs well under $10, but you have to know how to use it. And here's some pictures of their cooker. They're using a thermal compound to attach the diodes to the pot. And they've got three bigger solar panels, bigger than I would normally use, so they have a lot more power to work with. But what's really nice is in addition to showing how they built the cooker and all that, they go into detail about the robustness of diodes, what kind of temperatures they can handle. And they're using 3-amp diodes. I've personally never used 3-amp diodes, but I'm not saying they don't work, but I was a little bit concerned with the fragility of 3M diodes. They're very tiny. However, they may have a point using smaller diodes. Anyway, as long as they don't get too hot, it doesn't matter. This chart here is the take-home message. As you can see here, if we look at watt hours and heat, watt hours and heat are pretty much the same thing. Instead of expressing the heat performance as watt hours, these guys are going to use temperature, and you can see that it isn't even close. The diode chain absolutely annihilates the battery and or resistor combo, or the directly attached uh, heating element combo. Anyway, you can see the charts here are very well done. Uh, these are very nice color charts, and they go really into detail about the performance, the diode profiles in, under different conditions. You can see the, the line is very similar to charts I have gotten. It's kind of flat at the top. It does have some bumps in it. Um, part of that is because of the shadows in their test setup. So you can see it's not perfectly straight. And it's not perfectly flat either, but that's okay. It's not an MPPT circuit per se. It's very cheap. It doesn't have a lot of power, electronics, or components in it. And you can see that the diode chain temperature is plotted here in addition to the water temperature. So here you can see that their diode chain temperature is far exceeding the water temperature. And I, I know why that is. I've solved that problem in one of my designs. My diodes are well coupled to the, uh, the food that's inside, yet they're not in close contact with it. So I don't have this big gap here on my prototypes. I solved that problem. But it's not really an issue. They're just doing research to show the idea. I'm not attacking their work. They did a phenomenal job. And if you look at the diode voltage and the diode current, you can see the current varies quite a lot, but the voltage is more or less flat. Exactly what I've been saying in many of the videos I create. And here's some more charts they made. Excellent work. This is very, very nice to look at. It's very easy to... Uh, Figure out what you want to know. If you want to understand the voltage, the current, and to get watts, you just multiply uh, the voltage and current. That'll give you the watts, and then you add the time, you get watt hours, which is heat. So I prefer to work in watt hours, but I'm not against using temperature. Now, one point they do make that's important to look at is the wires connecting the diodes mean a lot. So if we look here, zero resistance leads. Well, that's not really possible, but if you have one ohm leads, you can see how it slants this chart way to the right, and that's that's not good. And their suggestion is to use good quality wire to attach the diodes to the solar panel. And of course, I agree with that. And it's an issue that I saw when I was testing my own diode prototypes. Uh, unfortunately, I had long, thin wire and it was affecting the readings, but it's okay. It still worked. I still got more heat. They're looking at how to use these diodes to extract more heat from smaller solar panels and therefore give cheaper solar electric cooking to everybody. I'm sure not just the people in Africa and Ghana and Uganda, but other places too. And they also here give you a list of the solar panels they're using, the exact model, everything. They are so detailed, it's phenomenal the amount of time they have to do this stuff. 
Uh, the thermostat, they use a thermostat. I never um, talked about a thermostat, but yes, you do need one. And the voltage and current data loggers drifted in value by as much as 3%. We adjusted readings in order to make the data self-consistent. Times were adjusted by as much as 10 minutes to make the graphs easier to read. So they are excruciatingly detailed and straightforward in how they present this work. I'm very impressed. And again, this is one of my favorite papers. If you want to read this paper, it's all over Google. It's all over the Internet. You can also Google for uh, solar diode cooker. And this paper will come up as one of the different results. There are other papers, but I love this one. I think they did a fantastic job. They also tested a battery in the loop, so connecting it to a battery, a resistance element. You don't connect diodes to a battery, but they connected a uh, resistance element to a battery and that to a solar panel and a charge controller, which is a fair thing to look at. It makes a lot of sense. However, nothing could beat the diodes in terms of heat output. Like I said, it's not even close. I mean, the charts really speak for themselves. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger here so you can see it. The yellow color, the kind of off yellow color, that's the temperature with the diode chain. And you can see it just blows away everything else. These lines down here, the kind of orange color, the gray, and the blue, here we have battery and resistor. Battery and resistor is referring to having a battery, a resistance heating element, and a solar panel. The battery kind of helps prop the voltage up when the sun goes in. However, you can see that the directly attached resistor beat that. So even a direct resistance heating element beat that. And then here's just a diode, which I believe they mean as a charge controller of some kind, or either just a blocking diode. It doesn't really matter at this point. But the kind of yellow line, kind of like a mustard color, as you can see, it just blows everything else away. I can't get over it. The difference is so big. Some of my uh, work did result in charts, but they're not as pretty as theirs. So I'm using their charts. Their charts are the best. And they have a data logger, so they can do all this stuff here. Now, I've been studying this paper for a really long time. It's, as I said, one of my favorite ones on the topic. Uh, I do want to make some comments. Uh, their diode heating element is cleverly made. It's basically a metal pot, and you have the diode chains glued to the exterior of uh, the cooking chamber. That's a metal pot. They also suggest securing it inside aluminum tubing as an immersion heater. And again, that's a very common suggestion I've gotten on the channel. It's a good idea. And a thermostatic switch. However, I do want to point out that in order to keep the diodes from overheating, they are thermally connected to the cook pot. This is one of the greatest challenges that you will face. If you try to use diodes, they must be thermally coupled to the water or the food that you're cooking. And I'm not referring to making an oven. I'm referring to making like a crock pot. You need to have some food, some, uh, food in there to have that heat absorbed and actually do the work. Otherwise, the diodes would just get hotter and hotter. And I really believe that if you look at some of the charts that they're showing, um, the thermal coupling between the water and the diodes is not adequate because that's the hardest part of the entire design. And I actually solved that in my design. And I haven't shown on the channel how I did that or discussed how I built it because it was very tedious. And frankly, I feel it could be patented. But I solved this problem. And the end result is that I observed exactly what they're showing here in these charts. The amount of heat that was there is just tremendous. And the resistance element works, and obviously it can cook the food. But with the diodes, you just get all this heat that you don't know what to do with. It just it's, it's overwhelming. And that's why you really need a thermostat, and that's why you really need to be careful, because with this much heating power, it's very easy for the diodes to get too hot and burn out. So you got to be careful. Could you make an oven with diode chains? I haven't actually tested that. Someone has suggested it. I'm not sure you can because their limit is really, for me, 100 to 120 C is as high as I ever want to go. Here you see they're going up to 160 C, but they're destroyed at around 170 Celsius. So I don't feel like diodes want to be that hot and I would like to keep them a little cooler. I just wanted to add these comments in. If you're trying to make a diode solar cooker, do your testing on the bench first and see how diodes react and how to get the heat out. Because remember, the purpose of this whole paper isn't about making diodes hot, believe it or not. It's about making the food hot or making the water hot. And if you get your diodes too hot, they're just going to burn up. And you know, a nichrome heating element, which is about as sophisticated as a string of diodes, um, it has the same problem. You get it too hot, it's going to burn up. So it's really the same exact problems you deal with with nichrome heating elements. And diodes don't uh, don't replace nichrome heating elements. They're just a different way of doing it, but they have different advantages. I think 40% more heat is a big deal. Of course, that number may not be exactly 40%. It might be 10, it might be 20, it might be 30. It's hard to say. It depends on how you build the prototype. It depends on how you extract the heat and so forth. For those of you who are interested in using diode chains and diode strings for solar cooker prototypes, 
I would also pay attention to 5.1.1, which is design recommendations. Here they're saying it's better to err on the side of using too few diodes than too many. Now I've seen this behavior in my tests, and they're saying to put fewer diodes. I actually erred on the other direction, I put too many. Uh, it's just a different way of going about it. They're also saying not to use thin wire, absolutely, you need thick wire. So good copper wire. If you have really thin wire connecting your solar panel, unfortunately, you start getting a mixture of ohmic and diode behavior, and it's very confusing. It can be so hard to get the match correct. So you want to use good quality wire to attach the cooker to the solar panel. In addition to the lead wires connected to the each end of the diode chain, connecting extra wires between the diode chain allows the user to easily change the number of diodes in a chain. Exactly what I'm talking about in some of my videos. You can use this as a power supply. And the cooker should be tested under operating conditions. Actually, that's a challenge. You never know when you're going to get enough sun. And uh, you need to test it under a variety of conditions to see how they perform. And the diodes should be thermally anchored as well as possible to the food being cooked. This is one of the biggest uh, messages in the entire paper. And it, it bears repeating. You must thermally anchor the diodes to the food being cooked. Well, that's, that's a challenge. It's not as easy as it sounds. What they're showing is using a thermal compound to anchor the diodes. And that's fine. There's 70 different ways, I'm sure, to do that. Um, I have my own ways of doing it which I have not necessarily gone into detail on. As long as the thermal coupling method or thermal anchoring method is effective and you get the heat out of the diodes and into the food, then you're good to go. Now here's something that's quite important. You should definitely read this if you're gonna work with diodes. Caution, diodes provide no resistance to current, thus connecting the diode chain to a voltage source with a high current capacity, like a battery, allows extremely high currents to flow, immediately destroying the diodes and risking a fire. The diode chain should only be connected to a power source with a limited current output, such as a solar panel. It's important to keep that in mind. This is about solar power directly into the food, not through a battery. Connecting a battery is risky because the diodes, if they're uh, going to pass too low of a voltage, what's going to happen is if you connect diodes across a battery and they're not properly set up, you're going to end up with basically a ton of current and it's going to fry those diodes instantly. You could have a fire. Somewhere in this paper, I know it's in here, uh, you have battery and resistor. So they did do the battery thing, um, but they didn't do it with uh, diodes. They did that with a resistance heating element. There would be zero point in connecting a string of diodes directly across a battery. Here they did do the battery and resistor though. However, you can see the battery and resistor, like everything else, cannot keep up with the diodes. It's not even close. Folks, I hope you enjoyed this quick look at a scientific research paper called Hot Diodes. Dirt Cheap Cooking and Electricity for the Global Poor. And for those of you who want to look deeper into this concept of using diodes for solar electric heating and cooking applications, uh, this is a really, really good paper to start studying. And they've done a lot of homework for us, and they did a really good job. And I just wanted to showcase their work on the channel because I think they deserve it. I think they did a good job. If you have any questions, feel free to let me know or post in the comments. Thanks for watching, folks, and I hope to see you next time. All related video and playlist links are posted in the description down below.